Um, thanks, Keith. Thanks, everybody who came out here and braved the weather <laughs> um, and, and everything to come out. Um, I was telling these guys, I feel like the past couple times I've ventured out of my little Wilkes-Barre Scranton bubble has been to like <clears throat> Philly, New York, and it's rained every single time. Um, and of course, it rained today. But at least, um, you know, it wasn't freezing. It wasn't 70 degrees like it was yesterday, but at least it's not super, super cold. Um, before I get started, I wanted to get an idea who in here has a company? So you're operating, you're up and running, you're making money. Okay, so a couple of us. How many are students? Students, either ESU or otherwise, okay. And then how many are here, um, whether or not you're a student, because you have a business idea or business ideas and you're just looking to kind of get some knowledge before you get up and running um, and before you implement that? Okay, so we've got a pretty, we've got a variety, variety of people here. Cool. Um, so Keith did a good job. Another super short introduction about myself. So um, I graduated with a degree with concentrations in accounting and entrepreneurship. Um, I got my CPA, been doing this, also working with the music app, which I'm not gonna talk about, but if you have questions, certainly come up and ask. Um, I knew from a pretty young age for most of my life that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and that I wanted to have my own business. Um, I knew that I just wasn't wired for a nine to five uh, and I didn't know what I wanted but I knew I wanted to be my own boss. So when I was in grade school, that looked like me moving to Australia and buying a horse ranch. Uh, when I was in high school, it was me opening a coffee house. When I was in college, I wanted to open an arts development center. Um, and naturally, naturally, with all of those very wild and colorful aspirations, I graduated college and became an accountant. Um, so uh, that actually progressed just from me knowing numbers. I was good at numbers. Um, and I knew that I was going to be able to use that knowledge to be able to open whatever business, I, or help in whatever business I wanted. Um, and I kind of figured it would look okay on a resume if I needed a job beforehand, which was true and which worked. So that all worked out. Um, but all that to say, I knew that I wanted to be a business owner. I knew that I wasn't wired to be a nine to five. My parents could have told you the same thing from when I was very young, that I was not somebody who would conform and follow the rules like I was supposed to. And I feel like that's where a lot of entrepreneurs stem from. Does, that, does anybody feel like that's kind of them, like you know, that you're wired just to kind of do your own thing? Anybody? Okay. So that's gonna be a lot of us in the entrepreneurial world. Um, but it's not everybody. There's a lot of people who come to this through just different types of things. So not necessarily that they're like, I gotta be my own person. Um, maybe they just had a hobby and the hobby was making money and it turned out the hobby was profitable so they turned it into a business. Um, there are a lot of businesses who are just born out of necessity. <laughs> people had bills to pay, so they started a company. Um, people come to this weird place that entrepreneurship is from all sorts of different walks of life and all sorts of di different situations. Um, but one thing that's pretty universal, that's gonna be anybody who's in business, is that a common goal is to make money. Yeah, can we all agree that we're here to make money? Whether or not that's our primary objective, we're here to make money. And I know that, I can say that with confidence because the definition of a business is that it's products or services that are designed to turn a profit. So we're trying to make money. Um, and it looked like everybody, everybody agrees on that, yeah? We're all on the same page, we're trying to make money? Yeah? yeah. Not, not too many people seem excited about this money thing. Okay, so we're here to make money. Everybody's in agreement on that. And this next one is where people get divided. So there are generally two schools of thought or two um, people that I see get divided. Uh, there's one group who are going into business to make a certain amount of money. Um, so they want to, I'm gonna get past this really quick, sorry. Um, they're trying to either maintain a certain lifestyle or send their kids to college or hit an income level that's gonna allow them to retire comfortably, whatever it is, there's a level that they want to reach and once they reach that level, they're happy. And that's what, that's what their goal is, to reach a certain level and that's where they're at and they're happy. So that's the first one. The second one is a group of entrepreneurs who 
are the go big or go home. I want my business to earn me as much money as reasonably possible with the efforts that I put into it. I want my company to make me as much money as it possibly can. Um, how many people would say is basically there's a level they want to get to and that's where they want to be and that's what they want their company to do for them? If, whether or not you have a company, eventually that's where it'll be. Couple. How many would say that they want their business to make them as much money as possible? That is super exciting to me. Normally it's the other way around. I love that that was where I was seeing those hands. I feel like a lot of times entrepreneurs get this money complex um, where they feel guilty about saying that. They feel guilty about saying, I want to make as much money as possible. Um, and there's this whole mental holdup around money and the goals people are setting around money. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that. And saying, I want my company to make me as much money as possible doesn't mean that you're gonna sit in the basement like Scrooge McDuck <laughs> and that you're not gonna use that money to um, you know, be charitable or use your time and your money to make the community better or make the world a better place. Um, it just means that you're, it's kind of like a dream big situation. You're dreaming big and you want your company to make you money. And I wanted to start with that because whatever your goals are, they are your goals, and they're, fine. They're, they're your goals, and they're okay, as long as they are yours, and as long as you have them, and you keep them in mind. Um, goal setting is so, so, so hugely important. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it, uh, I keep touching my microphone, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna go into it in, in a ton of detail right here, because first of all, it's way too deep an issue for me to even do justice in this one little presentation. Um, but I do wanna walk away, I just wanna share one quick story that I try to keep in mind when I'm talking about goals and money. Um, so there's three guys on a construction site. Okay, so there's three guys working on a construction site and they're laying bricks. They're putting bricks down in a line, doing their job. And a passerby comes up and he goes to the first guy and he says, what are you doing? The guy's like, what? Like, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm, I'm laying bricks, I'm putting bricks down. The passerby goes, okay. And he goes to the next construction worker and he says, what are you doing? And the construction worker goes, um, I'm building a wall. So I'm, I'm putting bricks down and then it's gonna be a wall. That's what I'm doing, is I'm building a wall. The passerby goes, all right. And then he goes to the third construction worker. He says, what are you doing? And that guy looks up and says, I'm building a hospital, and this hospital is going to make my community a safer and healthier place. And that may seem silly, but that's the kind of mentality that you've got to keep. Um, are there any financial professionals in the room? No, just me, that's fine, that's kind of what I expected. None of you, okay, are going into business to crunch numbers. That's fine. I didn't go into business to maintain a Facebook page, okay? There are a lot of jobs surrounding your business that you're gonna have to do that are not jobs that you went into business to do. <laughs> and the only way that you're gonna get through those is by keeping the reasons behind your reasons in mind. So um, you're not putting your financials together to send to your tax preparer just so that your tax return can get done, okay? You're doing that so that you can be tax compliant so that your company can be above the law, so that your company be, can be profitable, so that you can retire to Hawaii, or send all your kids to college so that they can graduate debt free, or so that you can take care of your parents when they age and they can be comfortable and well taken care of. There's all these reasons, and, and only you know what those reasons are, but if you can keep those in mind, um, it's gonna make everything else that you do um, more efficient and effective and just part of um, a business that's easier and more fulfilling to run. Um, so, all that in mind, I'm not gonna Tony Robbins anybody, okay? I can't help you manifest anything. I'm not gonna show you how to make millions and millions of dollars. Um, I'm just gonna tell you how to tax them. <laughs> that's my job. Um, we're gonna talk about pass-through entities, okay? Um, only because I feel like that's what most of you people are gonna be working with. So. Um, there are, the only, basically anything that's not a pass-through entity is a large corporation or what's called a C-corp. A vast majority of startups and small businesses are pass-through entities, 
So that's what we're going to focus on. And we've got three main points we're going to cover. So we're going to talk about the different types of pass-through entities. Bless you. Um, we're going to talk about the three types. So if you already have a business, maybe you'll get to understand your type a little bit better. If you don't, um, you'll hopefully see what the different options are and see which one's best for you when you do start your business. Um, the second, we're going to talk about how the income for each type of company is treated, so how that flows through to you and what taxes are applicable to them. And then third, based on what kind of company you have, um, how to maximize the income and minimize the tax effect on the income your company is going to make. Um, who, here had, who here had a business? Okay, does anybody have an LLC? Okay, I'm going to pick on Keith. Okay, so Keith, pop quiz. Sure. You go to an accountant, okay, it's a new accountant, and you shake hands and you sit down and you say, I want you to file my company's tax return. And the CPA says, okay, what kind of tax return does your company file? You say, I have no idea. <laughs> All right, well, that wasn't what I was looking for. Lots of people, <laughs> that's why you come to us. Um, lots of people walk in and they say, well, I've got an LLC return, which is not true. Um, there's no such thing as an LLC return. And lots of people have LLCs and there's whole, there's lots and lots of misunderstanding around what an LLC is. Um, what people need to understand and what financial professionals are really, really bad at getting across um, because financial professionals really generally aren't the greatest at communication to begin with is that every company has a legal entity, okay, it's got a, a legal structure, like the bones of your business and what it is, and then it has a tax status or a tax type. And the legal structures are just what they sound like. It's the bones of your business. It's what your business or who your business is. It's where the legal responsibilities and liabilities sit with. It's, it is the nature of the company. So the first one, or the you know, easiest one lots of people think of, is the sole proprietor, okay? And the sole proprietor is you. If you have a sole proprietorship, you are the company. Legally, tax-wise, it is you. And it's super easy to set up a sole proprietor. I'll tell you how easy. If I go to a neighbor and I say, hey, you haven't gotten your dog out of the house in the wild, do you want me to take it for a walk? And they say, sure. And I say, sounds good. That'll be $10, please. I've created a sole proprietor. Legally, I have just started a business. So I am a company as soon as I accept money for goods or services, um, with a few exceptions. There's like hobby things, but for the most part, as soon as you accept money for something, you have created a business as a sole proprietor. Um, a partnership is basically the same thing with multiple people. So now, if two of us walk over to my neighbor and say, we want to walk your dogs, we've created a partnership. Um, again, it's legally more confusing because there's multiple people and then there's issues on where the liability sits with, if one of you does something stupid. Um, but it's pretty much just the same thing as a sole proprietor with multiple people, a partnership. The LLC is what everybody likes to hear, what everybody generally signs up for. Everybody likes having an LLC because it limits your liability. It is a limited liability company. Um, and what the LLC means, I'm not an attorney, so don't, uh, uh, this is not legal advice. <laughs> Um, but what an LLC means is that if I create a single member LLC, meaning it's just me, um, before going to take my neighbor's dogs for walks, if a hawk comes down and, and absconds with my neighbor's chihuahua and my neighbor decides to sue the pants off of me, if I have an LLC, they can't take my house. Okay. In theory, that's the purpose of an LLC, is that you can't lose more than is already sitting with the LLC. <laughs> um, another thing with LLC, just since we're talking about um, legal things right now, a lot of times people um, will have multiple LLCs to split up liabilities. So if somebody opens a gym, say, um, they will set up one LLC to operate the gym, and if they buy the building, they'll set up another LLC to own the building. And basically, one of their LLCs is going to pay the other. And again, the whole purpose is so that 
Somebody can't injure themselves in the gym and then sue them and then take everything. So that's kind of the purpose of the, legal, of the LLC, is to kind of um, partition your legal responsibilities there. And then finally is a corporation. Um, corporations have a lot of moving parts that we're not gonna get into right now, but that is the fourth legal structure of a company. So these are the only legal structures you can have currently in the United States, is a sole proprietor, a partnership, an LLC, and a corporation. The S Corp, which is what a lot of companies know as for their tax returns, is not here. It's not a legal structure, it's just a tax status. So these are the legal structures. And these are the tax types related to those legal structures. So as an individual, if I start walking my neighbor's dogs, and I've created a sole proprietor, when it comes to tax time, I'm gonna file the same tax return that everybody here files, which is a 1040, okay? It's just your personal tax return, and that company money gets reported on the Schedule C. If I open a company with another person, it's a partnership, which has its own tax return, which is the 1065. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing here. And the LLC is where it gets fun. So the LLC is kind of a, um, like a little bit of a legal chameleon. So again, if I wanted to protect myself and my, uh, you know, my assets, my home, my you know, legal stuff uh, from my company operations, I can create what's called a single member LLC. It's still just me, okay? But I have that little bit of a legal protection and I can file a 1040 and a Schedule C just as if I was a sole proprietor. So I've created that LLC to get me a little bit of legal cushion, but it's still, for tax purposes, the same exact thing. Um, you can also do it with a multi-member LLC. So they say there are multiple people and they want to create a multi-member LLC, they can do the same thing, set up the LLC, and get taxed just as they would if they were a regular partnership. So it can be an LLC, an LLC taxed as a partnership. If at any point it becomes beneficial for us tax-wise to be filed as an S-Corp, and you'll see why that might be the case in a little bit, if at any point I say, oh, it would be better to be taxed as an S-Corp, all I do is write a letter to the IRS saying, hey, I wanna be an S-Corp now, and voila, my LLC is being taxed as an S-Corp. So that's why everybody loves the LLC. It's so convertible, you can do different things with it um, and treat it differently for tax purposes. Um, the corporation is kind of in a similar boat. You can have a corporation that's taxed as a, the S Corp is a small corporation. Don't know if I mentioned that. Um, so you can have a corporation that's taxed as a small corporation, or it can be taxed um, at the big kids table with an 1120, which we're not gonna talk about at all. Those are pretty complicated. Um, so it seems like we've got a whole lot of options here for setting up a company for the legal and tax statuses. Um, why would we pick one over the other? Um, we already talked a little bit about the legal reasons you might pick one legal structure over another legal structure, but when it comes to taxes, um, the driving force behind that decision basically boils down to self-employment tax. Uh, looks like PowerPoint messed that up a little bit for me, but um, self-employment tax is where all of these decisions revolving different businesses come into play. And self-employment tax is uh, thrown around a lot in the entrepreneurial community. It's pretty scary. It's a big old tax that nobody wants to deal with. Um, but really, all that it is, is FICA. And I wasn't gonna be able to get through this presentation without an acronym. <laughs> so FICA is just the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, um, which is, again, just a fancy name for Medicare and Social Security. So when you got your very first job, and you were super excited to get your very first paycheck, and then you opened your paycheck, and you're like, where the heck did my money go? Okay, part of that went to Medicare and Social Security. So all that is, is the government saying, you're young, you're strong, you're healthy, you're working, you're making money, um, we're gonna take some of that from you, so that when you're older, and not working, and need a little bit of help, um, in theory, for however much longer the system works in our current economy, the idea is that you'll be able to take Medicare and Social Security. So that's all FICA is, is um, or that's all self-employment taxes, is your FICA, which is Medicare and Social Security. Um, when you got that, page, uh, that pay stub, that paycheck, 
um, you paid 6.2% of Social Security, and you paid 1.45% in Medicare. That's what you paid as an employee. But your employer, so the person who was giving you that paycheck, also paid 6.2% in Social Security and 1.45% in Medicare. So both you and your employer were paying basically 7.65% of your wages straight to the government, to this FICA. When you don't have a job, okay, so when you are self-employed or you have your own business, you don't have anybody withholding that money from you. Um, so the IRS says, well, we still want it. So all self-employment tax is, is, so self-employment tax is 15.3%, which is just the employer portion of FICA, which is 7.65, and the employee portion of FICA, which is 7.65. Um, all in all, though, that adds up to a lot, and we want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, but that's what self-employment tax is in the grand scheme of things. So now we're going to talk about how, um, how we can avoid that. So as a sole proprietor, so um, if I just go out and I start a business and I start making money and I want to put it right on my personal return, every dime that I make is subject to income tax and self-employment tax. Okay? So I've got my company income, I've got my company expenses taken out of that, and I've got my net amount, which is taxed out the wazoo, I get income tax, which is basically whatever rate you're already being taxed on your other, your family's other income, income tax and self-employment. Um, it's really straightforward. I don't have to share it with anybody, but I'm being taxed on it. The partnership is similar. So the partnership, um, interesting uh, segue here though, a partnership, you can have a partnership which is 50-50 owned, which is how a lot of partnerships are, like, oh, we own it 50-50. Um, but if one of you works more or works harder or has different skill sets in that company, you can elect to have profits and losses divided differently. Um, that's more of just kind of a snippet for you. So you can say like, oh, we're 50-50 owners, but I work harder or I have more credentials, so I get 75% of the profits. That exists. But however those profits are divvied up is how the income is treated to you as a, when you're a partnership. And it's the same exact thing. So company income, company expenses, and then whatever's left over gets divvied out to me at whatever percentage I'm supposed to get it, and that money gets treated the same way. Income tax on everything, self-employment tax on everything. That's how everything works with uh, 1040s and partnerships. And the S Corp is why everybody gets really, really excited about not only having the LLC to get the legal uh, benefits, but also being able to get the tax benefit of this, the, um, the S Corp. So the small corporation has two streams of income. Basically, it breaks your income up into two different streams. And the first stream is a salary. So once your company is making enough money to give you a salary, you're going to have one stream of income that's a salary and one stream that's just everything that's all of the income that's left over after you've taken that salary. The FICA and the, the self-employment tax is only applicable to that salary. Everything else is completely exempt. So you pay income tax on it, but you don't have to pay any on self-employment tax. And at 15.3%, that's kind of a big deal. And that's why everybody likes having the, the S Corp, because they they're not eligible, um, or they're not liable, rather, for self-employment tax. Oh, I actually didn't include, so for corporations rather, and again, we weren't going to talk about corporations, but I just want to give you an idea of why those are so much more complicated. A corporation pays money on the income before it even gets to you. So that's what you hear people talking about double taxation of a corporation. Um, the corporation has already paid a whole bunch of money on the income that it makes. It's taxed on it at corporate tax rates. You hear about the corporate tax rates. It gets taxed on them. And then when you get that money from your corporation, you're paying tax on it again. Um, and then there's, whole, there's different streams of the corporations. You get dividends and a salary and different things. So we're not going to talk about corporations. Um, so you would think, like, it seems like the LLC and the S Corp combination is kind of like a dead ringer. Like, why would anybody not do the corporation with a, um, an LLC? Um, the pros is that there's no self-employment tax. 
which seems really great because it's kind of high and nobody wants to pay more tax than they should. Um, the cons is that, uh, first of all, we have to run payroll. Have any of our business owners running payroll, having to deal with payroll systems? Yeah. Um, especially depending on the state that you're in. Oh, and again, this is all just federal stuff. Um, states have their own, especially with Pennsylvania, because we've got all these crazy local things going on. <clears throat> um, Pennsylvania is just kind of its own little mess. But just even for federal issues, you've got to run payroll, which means you've got to pay a processor, um, you've got to file the payroll taxes, deal with all those, uh, especially in Pennsylvania, they've got local things. It's just kind of another thing to juggle that you've got to deal with and another thing to pay for. Um, you've got to file multiple tax returns. So if you were um, being taxed as a uh, 1040 and it was just me, it's just going on my personal return, it's all I have to worry about. Um, if I want to do an S Corp, it's got to be its own return. Um, for me, that's not that big a deal because I'm filing my own tax returns. If you're working with a CPA or you've got a financial professional you're working with, that can be you know, a couple hundred bucks at the end of the year. So that's just another obstacle. And then also, you can't flip back and forth. If you tell the IRS that you want to be an S Corp, it's immediate. They say, okay, sounds good. As long as you've got it in like the right timeline, they'll give it to you. If the next year you're like, eh, I don't really want to have to deal with this payroll thing and I don't want to have to pay another tax return. I'm not really making enough money to make it worth it. I take it back. I don't want to be an S Corp. They'll let you do that, but then you've got to wait another five years to turn it back on again. It's just tricky um, and there's, no, there's technically no way to revoke S Corp status. You've got to write them a letter and get a hold of them and anytime you've got to get a hold of the IRS. It's just, just a mess. Um, so, ideally, the S Corp is only beneficial, or it's only useful once you have an S Corp, once your company earnings, so once your company is making more money than what's called a reasonable salary. Does anybody have to deal with that with the IRS, looking up reasonable salary? Yeah. So until your company makes more than your reasonable salary, it's generally not worth it to be an S Corp, and I'll show you why. Um, a reasonable salary, according to the IRS, um, has a couple different factors. First of all, how skilled you are. So, um, you know, if you're in a, a, you know, we were talking about a knowledge economy, um, it's your credentials, it's how, how, um, how much experience you have, um, the work that you're doing. Um, I could be really skilled and only do, you know, 10 hours of work a week. Uh, that's that's going to go, you know, factor into the salary also. Um, the size and complexity of the business. Um, I might do the same exact work as somebody at, you know, P, you know Price Waterhouse, um, but they're not going to expect me to take the same salary as somebody there would. Um, economic conditions, depending on what the economy looks like. Um, comparison of salary to distributions. So this is where people get caught up. They think, okay, well, I've got my two different streams, right? I've got a company and I've got my salary stream and my income stream, and I want to keep as much on the income stream because that's what I'm not paying self-employment tax on. Um, so business owners say, all right, my salary has to be reasonable, but I want it to be as low as possible. That's why there's a requirement for it to be a reasonable salary because the salary portion is what you're paying the self-employment tax on. So as a business owner, and there have been court cases out the wazoo with the IRS saying that's not a reasonable salary and the people taking the IRS to court basically saying, well, yes, it is. And it's gone both ways. There have been um, cases where the IRS has lost. Um, but when you want your salary to be as low as possible, um, you want to take as much out from the income and um, that's what the distribution is called. So if we're back here, so this is your salary and the one up top is your distribution. So that's just a distribution of income. Um, comparison of salary to previous years. So if you say, okay, I want my salary to be as low as possible and last year it was reasonable, but it was, you know, 60K. I mean, 55K is close, right? So it's probably also reasonable. Um, but if you're going to try to argue to the IRS that you're taking 55 this year, but you took 60 last year, 
Um, they're probably going to give you a little bit of a hard time about it because you can't bring it back down. That's not how reasonable salaries work. Um, and then finally, to similar positions. So you got to look around the industry. You know, I'm sure you guys, especially if you're getting ready to graduate, you know, glass door kind of stuff, looking at different salaries um, and seeing what else is reasonable. Um, ultimately, though, when it comes to paying yourself from a company, uh, there's kind of somewhat of a timeline. Um, and this is not a timeline that most companies are going to go through because I've got multiple legal entities on here. And like I said, your legal entity just generally doesn't change. Um, but I'll use myself as an example. So when I started, when I moved back up here from Atlanta and started my own accounting firm, it was just me, okay? I had no employees, no office, no nothing. Um, I was starting from scratch, from ground zero, square one. Um, so I started as an LLC. I didn't start as a sole proprietor. I went straight for the LLC because I wanted the legal protection. Um, but I started as an LLC taxed as a sole proprietor because I had hardly any money that I was making to even be worried about self-employment tax. I was just trying to make money. Um, so I started with an LLC being taxed as a sole proprietor. Um, once, so that's wanting to legal, uh, limit the legal liability. Once you earn enough that your company is making more money than your salary, that's when you want to file the S-Corp election. So once you're making enough, you can file as an S-Corp, you're gonna be able to take some money out as a distribution, which isn't getting the self-employment tax on it. And that's, for a lot of companies anyway, that's kind of where it's gonna end, um, as long as it's set up correctly. Um, eventually, and I hope this for how, whoever in the room is looking, you know, I have a big giant conglomerate corporation. Um, I've got another, like, you know, another startup that I'm working on um, is a corporation because we're hoping ideally to get a whole bunch of funding and be, you know, the next uh, Uber, Spotify, whatever you want to say. Um, but that is where you would enter into a whole other level of legal and tax situations and be taxed as an actual corporation. Um, so ultimately, for the people in this room, um, start small. There's nothing wrong with starting small. Um, make enough money to where you're making a reasonable salary. And then once you hit that number, it's generally best to do an S corporation from whatever status you started at and avoid the self-employment tax.